Today we're honored to have with us, uh, as a guest speaker, Dr. Hans Blix, um, who will discuss uh, the fate of the NPT as it stands today. Um, as some of you are aware, the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has been um, a key feature in the world's attempts to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. Um, it has played a critical role in creating transparency, confidence, predictability in the world, uh, but ultimately it relies on member states uh, to adhere to it and um, at some point maybe the three, member, or three states that are not members will at one point become members. Um, but the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is under increasing stress in my view. Um, everyone knows about the situations in uh, North Korea and in Iran, but I think, as you will hear today, there, there's another stress placed on the treaty, and that is the disarmament obligations that the uh, original five nuclear weapon states uh, are under to disarm. There's been some progress uh, with the U.S. and Russia, but little progress on other fronts, and these are things that will have to be rectified. But there's no one better to talk about this issue uh, than our speaker today, Dr. Blix. Um, he has uh, lived, uh, dedicated his life to public and international service. He was the foreign minister of Sweden. Uh, he acted as the director general for the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has responsibility for uh, overseeing the nuclear programs throughout the world, at least from the member states of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, I had the honor of working with him at the United Nations uh, for the United Nations Monitoring, Verification, and Inspection Commission in Iraq. Um, and most recently, he, well, he was uh, head of the, uh, the uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission, uh, which completed its work a few years ago, and is presently the chairman of the International Advisory Board for overseeing the, um, uh, or aiding the uh, nuclear programs in Abu Dhabi. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to Dr. Blix. Um, I know he's, I think you're going to speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll have a limited time for questions. Uh, we may not get to all of your questions, but we'll try our, our very best. So thank you, Dr. Blix. Thank you very much. Well, when I have talking points, I never know how long it will be. But when you begin to shake your watches, I shall <laughs> take care. I could preface my remarks in, in many different uh, ways, but perhaps I should declare from the beginning that I do favor nuclear power and I am against nuclear weapons. The other preface I'd like to make is the uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, is the term that we usually we use nowadays. The non-proliferation treaty is directed to nuclear. And uh, what is a nuclear weapon is not defined in the non-proliferation treaty, and I come back to that. It simply says that you're prohibited from manufacturing uh, or otherwise acquiring a nuclear weapon. But let me begin on a light tone uh, by about this definition. Uh, a number of years ago, I had a mail from a lady on <coughs> the other side of the world, and she said she uh, wanted to give her cat my name. She wanted to call her cat Blix. Did I have any objection to that? <laughs> and I mailed back and said that, no, no, I felt very honored. We love cats. And, but I wanted to know that the cat accepted the name. <laughs> 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 and then she mailed back and said that, yes, the cat seems very happy with the name and now works beautiful as a weapon of ma mice destruction. <laughs> 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 so that was one, one definition, there can be many others, but now we're dealing with one particular kind of weapons of mass destruction, namely the nuclear one. And the NPT that entered into force in 1970 might be said to aim for a nuclear weapon-free world. Uh, the non-nuclear weapon states, parties, the five, they promised to uh, they promised to, the, the, the majority promised to stay away from nuclear weapons. And the nuclear weapon states, the five that were named, they promised to try to do away with the nuclear weapons by saying that they will negotiate in good faith and together with everybody else to do away with the nuclear weapons. So it might well be described as a treaty that aimed to free the world from nuclear weapons. And we must admit that the results have been relatively poor. And they are the poorest, I think, in the terms of disarmament for the world, uh, but they have not been entirely successful on the avoiding the spread of nuclear weapons. 
But I'll devote some remarks first to the question of nuclear disarmament. We know that during the peak of the Cold War, there were over 50,000 nuclear warheads in the world, in the, mostly in the US and the USSR. And after the Cold War, this number shrank to about over 20,000. That's where we are now, 20,000 plus nuclear weapons, still most of them in the US and in Russia. And in 2007, the four <coughs> humor former US statesmen, Kissinger and Rahn and Schultz and uh, uh, Perry, uh, stated that in their view, nuclear weapons were obsolete between Russia and the United States and obsolescent elsewhere. And they urged a, that the two countries should take the initiative to lead the world out of the nuclear weapons era. And then came Obama to power. And we listened to him in London, where he met Mr. Mugabe. And then later on in, Tra in Prague, in a very famous speech in London, the two were agreed that they would aim for a global zero. So, and realizing that it was far away, but this was their aim. And a lot of other things also where they might go to do to get together. The result of that <coughs> campaign was considerable in the year of 2010. Above all, what we know most about is the START agreement that was concluded and that was a, a binding agreement and under which they, they commi committed themselves to reducing the number of deployed strategic nuclear weapons to 1,550, which was a rather modest reduction actually from what they had. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a binding agreement and it was important, there was a new signal. But it was not the only result, there was also a conference in Washington about nuclear security, which aimed to see to it that we sort of can the vacuum claim the world from plutonium <laughs> enriched uranium that may be around, or, or research reactors that uh, operate in highly enriched uranium, et cetera, et cetera, and trafficking. Uh, so Washington conference that was followed up later on, as you remember last year, by the Seoul, Seoul conference, that had its also its, its value, but not as spectacular as the nuclear disarmament. And then we had the NPT review conference in 2010 <coughs> that, different from the earlier ones, came out with a consensus declaration. Earlier, the conferences had often been had a very sharp clash between the non-nuclear weapon states who were dissatisfied and saying, we are remaining non-nuclear, but you, the nuclear weapon states, you are not really doing your part of the bargain. You are not reducing. The US and Russia at the time of 1910, 2010, they admitted <coughs> and agreed that yes, they had an obligation under the NPT to disarm. This was a position that was not taken by the Bush administration, the prior Bush administration. So there was a good deal of hope um, at, the, at that time. Since then, I'm afraid we have gone backward. Today and the past year, all the focus is on the financial crisis and very little intention paid to the nuclear any longer. Not even the environment, not even the global warming is <laughs> hitting the headlines as much as they've done before. And, and I think it is terrible. I think we need to devote attention to all the three problems. They are really existential problems all the view. The end, the Conference on Disarmament, Committee on Disarmament in Geneva, is, remains in coma, as it has been for over 10 years. They don't get anywhere. Uh, they want to discuss the fissile material cutoff, and Pakistan, uh, for one, has been stubbornly opposing that. There have been some, some flexibility. The US has become more flexible, I think, in accepting to discuss uh, the outer space issues. But still, the fact is that they do not get down to, to work. And we also see a good deal of re rearmament around in the world. Uh, the uh, US, Mr. Putin announces that they will modernize their forces and they spend a lot more money on it. China is also modernizing their forces. But India, Pakistan, Thailand, all, all over, we see a great deal of result, not least in this part of the world. I think it is terrible that the world is spending $1.8 billion, $1 billion a year on this when we need switch energy systems and we need to defend the climate of the world. Now, we have seen Mr. Obama was re-elected and we <coughs> hear him uh, saying that they would like to, to follow up on the START agreement and, and get yet another one. And the aim seems to be to come down to 1,000 uh, <coughs> nuclear deployed weapons rather than 1,550. The hope of getting a Senate approval of that is very low, and therefore at least the newspapers speculate that he will 
try for a unilateral action, as President Bush the Elder did in the beginning of the 90s, me and Mr. Gorbachev, when they did undertook a very a, enormous disarmament in tactical nuclear weapons, and they did it through what was called the Presidential Initiative, which meant that they meant parallel to the same target, and the, 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 the disarmament happened. And in that way, Mr. Obama could uh, ob obviate the need for Senate approval. Whether he will succeed, we don't know. They have to negotiate first, and we'll see whether they, whether they, they manage. So there is again a bit of a, a hope uh, that that the dominant uh, process will start again. One can wonder why, what drives the rearmament. Uh, because after the end of the communist period, there is no ideological warfare any longer. And wars used to be provoked either by border issues or by the wish to grab land or actual religion and, and, and ideology. And with the end of the Cold War, we do not see that this ideolo ideological drive is behind it. So what continues to be the drive behind the current conflict? Well, we can see some potential uh, conflicts of friction between China and the United States in, in Asia and, and so forth, but not between the, really between the five great powers any longer. So it's hard to say in regional rights, we can see, yes, many reasons for conflict in the Middle East or in Africa and so forth, but they are not really global con conflicts. Now, so much for disarmament that has been, ra been rather poor and under the empathy, and the, which may perhaps have a little springtime again, we hope so. Let me then look at the question of spread of nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapons sta states, they have a tendency to say the only <coughs> problem in the world is, is the risk of a spread of weapons. We are not dangerous. We have the weapons. We are not dangerous. It's the other ones. Those who don't have the weapons, they are the ones who are the dangerous. And that irritates those who don't have, it, have the, the weapons. But of course, we all recognize that the spread having more triggers on more nuclear we weapons is, is a very dangerous thing. And therefore, we agree that the NPT has a very good aim. The ambition was, when the NPT was concluded, that there should be no more than the five nuclear weapon states they were at, at the time. Uh, <coughs> and the ambition was that everyone, all other states should adhere as non-nuclear weapon states. Well, it succeeded to a large extent, but not fully, because India, Pakistan, and Israel did not adhere, and they developed nuclear weapons, all the three of them. Then we saw North Korea withdrew from the NPT, and, uh, but on the other hand, you, and you had also, I should mention, that Iraq and Libya tried to go for nuclear weapons, and they were stopped on the path. But you also had some success stories. You had when the Soviet Union was dissolved, you had Ukraine and Belarus and Kazakhstan, which all the three had nuclear weapons on their territory. They gave away these weapons to Russia, so they did not become nuclear weapon states. And South Africa, of course, after the end of the apartheid regime, decided to, to drop their nuclear, to do, not to drop, but to do away <laughs> with their nuclear <laughs> weapons. <laughs> <laughs> and we in the IEA were called in to, to verify that they, they were gone. Now today, it's the DPRK, North Korea and Iran, that are, the, are they're very different in, in many ways, but there are also some common points. I would like to just mention one point that's common. And that is <coughs> the, 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 the need in both, case, both sides, I think, cases to, for, to feel secure, feel strategic sec security. I was the chairman, as you mentioned, of the Commission on Death of Mass Destruction, and we found that in most cases, the drive to go for nuclear weapons was caused by a perceived security need. Might not be real, but a perceived security need at any rate. And if you want to get countries to, to go away from the nuclear weapons, well, then you have to also make sure that the perception changed. You have to give some assurances. I think in the case of North Korea, this is pretty clear. I, I will skip talking in detail about it because you are more interested in Iran and this region. But in the case of North Korea, we know that during the Korean War in 1950, the US military asked for authorization to use nuclear weapons against North Korea, and they were given authorization, but they didn't do it. But the North Koreans had never forgotten that. And they have imagined the United States as the big enemy, and that's what they still do. To me, it's a little of a mystery how they can think that Obama was a greater danger than Bush, <laughs> but <laughs> nevertheless, they certainly still see and say that, that the US is the big enemy. And therefore, I think that an indispensable element for a settlement of that dispute is uh, about North Korea is that
that there will be a peace treaty, that the armistice will be succeeded by a peace treaty. And I'm sure that the negotiators are aware of that. They haven't succeeded yet, but that will be an important part of it. I think m even more than that, probably a need for some, a, 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 a not an alliance, but, but some kind of security arrangement which will involve several the big countries in the area, China, Russia, Japan, and the United States. <laughs> you need to instill a feeling of security that no one will attack another one as part of it. Otherwise, what I'd like to say about North Korea is the risk that exists there, as it does here, of a domino effect of North Korea. If they proceed on the path on which they have been in a very aggressive in tone, and also doing some action, being, being rather aggressive. If these steps in the past North Korea were to lead Japan towards an interest in moving for nuclear weapons, Japan is pretty well uh, vaccinated against <laughs> nuclear weapons. But nevertheless, even today, you hear some voices in Japan who sort of say that yes, we should have it, and they have plenty of plutonium, they have plenty of skill, no one doubts that they could acquire a nuclear weapon if they really made up their mind to do so. Now, if that were to happen, if they were no longer to rely, allow themselves to rely upon the American umbrella and their support, then the relations in the Far East would be very different from what they are today. Now, that leads me to the, to the next step, namely that China should have a tremendous in interest in avoiding that North Korea <coughs> go further on the path where they are. There may be limitations upon how much in China can influence North Korea. In Korea, there's, there were some different lim limitations upon the Russia could influence Romania during the Cold War. But nevertheless, they do have a leverage there, and they should have a very strong interest in preventing North Korea from going further. At the same time, it's clear that China will not cherish the idea of having North Korea collapse and the creation of a united Korea, where allied with the United States, and with perhaps also with the Allies being all the way up to the Yalu River. They would like to have a buffer in between. And how to finesse that is certainly a big, big job for diplomacy ahead. And it is, it is certainly a very grave danger, if, as we see it now, if the North Koreans were to go on and if they were not to succeed. Now, let me go then go on to the question of Iran that is, is more, more acute in this area. And we hear it said in newspapers and by politicians that it's a question of either the Iranian bomb or bombing Iran. Let's put it as crudely as that. Now, to me, the perspective of war is a disaster. And I think those who come and sort of the innuendo, whose innuendo is that they should go for war, they should be asked, now, how, what will that solve? You can rightly say that diplomacy has gone on for a number of years here and it has not yielded results. Yes, we agree, I agree to that, and I think we have to admit that. What will you solve by a, a war? Now, the first thing you realize is that if Iran is attacked, they certainly will not sit there and twiddle their thumbs. There will be some countermeasures. Where, we don't know. In the worst case, you could have a conflagration in the region that already has enough war and has had enough of war. So the specter of the, of the actual happening of the war is pretty, pretty hor horrifying. The second point is that if you have a war, one, with perhaps destroying a number of nuclear installations in Iran, perhaps destroying very much more, what will be the follow-up of that in Iran? Will there not be a situation in which the current opposition, which certainly exists in Iran, ran a rally to the support of the government? You will not have the opposition any longer. They will all be patriots and nationalists, and they will, if they were not had not the decision before to go for nuclear weapons, they might well take it then, because they will say that if we had had a nuclear weapon, we might not have been attacked. North Korea is not attacked, so we might as well go for it. It will take some time. And sometimes you hear Israelis saying that, how do you do that? Well, we will mow the lawn, as they say. We'll come in from time to time to bomb. But, well, is that really specter that you support? We know that they bombed Iraq in 1981. We know that they bombed a Syrian reactor in what is 2007, now urging a bombing in, in Iran. Is this a strategy, is a tenable, a sustainable strategy? I don't think so. And therefore, I think that the, the idea, of the urging for a war is, is a, I think, a, almost a reckless, uh, reckless line to be taken by, by the hopes. <coughs> now, the second objection I have to it is one that is not mentioned very much, and which we should mention, that is the legal one. 
This is amazing that hardly anyone discusses whether such an attack on Iran would be legal or not. Uh, the only one I've seen say, mention it was the attorney, President Car Attorney General of the UK, who voiced some doubts whether it was legal. Well, we had a, a strong debate about Iraq after the Iraq war, about the legality of it, and Kofi Annan, <laughs> and I myself, and I think the majority of international lawyers said that no, this was a violation of the UN Charter. UN Charter allows an attack in two situations. One is self-defense against an armed attack. Now, Iran is not going to attack anybody. They haven't had an aggressive pattern for a very long time. They're not going to attack. Well, they know very well if they, they did, that would be provocation, so they're not going to do that. The other situation in which you can attack a country is if you have an authorization from the Security Council. The Security Council could judge the situation to be a threat to the peace and decide on more than, than merely merely economic sanctions and authorize the war. They're not going to do that. We know that. Russia will, ne will be negative, and yet China will also veto it. I they would not even have a majority for it. If they went to the General Assembly, I am pretty convinced that the General Assembly there would be a strong majority against any attack on, on, on Iran. So there is no way, in, in, to my view, one can make a war in the, against Iraq and attack Iran a legal measure. And I think it's, it makes me sad to know that 10 years after the Iraq war, we are there again and that people say, well, forget about that. We, <coughs> we think we are dangerous. And I see that in the US, uh, Senator Gray, Gray, Lindsey Graham saying that if Iraq, if uh, Israel feels uh, compelled to act in self-defense uh, and attack Iran, then the United States must support and stand behind Israel economically, diplomatically, and military. So I think don't, he doesn't give many pennies for the, for the UN Charter, but many of others do. And I, I would be amazed if Europe, European countries would participate in an armed attack <coughs> on, on Iran. Now then, what can be done? And, uh, and what is the situation? Comparing to Iraq, I could say that in the case of Iraq, the, those of the Alliance of Willing States, they sought to eradicate weapons that did not exist. In the case of Iran, they are discussing the eradication of intentions that might not exist. That's where we are. But how can we then work on? We have to be realistic and establish what is this situation, just as we have as a job and as inspectors in the case of Iran. It is clear that Iran is getting closer to an option of having, of, of, of acquiring and making nuclear weapons. And the suspicion arose from the very day when they started with enrichment, because enrichment cannot be an economic proposition for Iran. South Korea has 20 nuclear power reactors. They find it more economic to import enrichment than to my own country has 10 nuclear reactors. We also import, it's cheaper. So it's not that Iran has an advantage from this point of view. It costs them more than that. Now, they could say that they need it to be self self-supplying self-sufficient, because they had an experience after the revolution that they wanted to buy fuel from the Trigger reactor that produces medical ice stops, and they had paid for it in the United States, and they didn't get it. So they were stopped from this. And eventually, they managed to supply their fuel by buying it from Argentina. And that fuel has run out, and that's why they need more fuel now. They could say that, yes, we cannot rely upon the outside world. I think I, they can make that argument. There is a, a grain <coughs> of truth in it. At the same time, I think that the offers that came from Russia to Iran, and could have come from others, from China, from Japan, that, that they assured Iran of a supply of fuel for the reactor, was, was a serious one. And, and that the argument about self-sufficiency was not really that heavy. Not inexistent, but not really that heavy. heavy. So the suspicions, I think, were understandable from the moment that they started with enrichment, and then they're building a, a, a heavy water reactor in Iraq, and lots of other things. And it adds to it, and the IEA claims that they see some things that they could not explain unless they were also meant to be a preparation for a weapon. But no one claims that they have built a weapon, which is the criteria of the, of the non-proliferation <coughs> treaty. And no one even claims that there is a decision taken, even the US government is not taking the view that they see such a decision has been taken. So the question of approaching more, more and, and more. And the approach of the Western world, and added to that China and, and Russia, the P5 plus one, including Germany, has been 
has shifted over time. It began with the Europeans, the E3, the UK and France and Germany. And they put up carrots on the table. The Iranians don't like the word carrot because they associate it with donkeys, they say. But, <laughs> but I used to remind them that in the United States, the big uh, Democratic Party symbol is carrots. You know, they shouldn't be so insulted about that. <laughs> anyway, the E3 put carrots on the table. They said that we want you to suspend enrichment and we are willing to give carrots. And they were substantial, they were juicy carrots. One of them was to give support to getting into the World Trade Organization. Another one was to uh, help them in the further de development of their civilian nuclear power program. And there were facilitation uh, of investment, etc. There were a number of juicy carrots, and it didn't help. They wouldn't have that. Then in came, the US was a backseat driver at that time. Then in came the U US eventually, and you had more sticks. And the US went over to the Security Council, and they got some rather mild uh, sanctions uh, against, the, uh, against Iran. But that didn't help. So they, they upped the sanctions. And as we have seen, the latest, uh, latest form of that is an oil um, boycotting of purchases of oil and of gas, which is a very hurting and hurts the Iranian economy very significantly, surely. But Nevertheless, they have mo not moved, and what you hear is, is rather that, that they will not move just, in, just for such sanctions, for such pain. And we heard Khomeini say not so long ago that we are not going to negotiate with someone holding a, a pistol against our head. I think the Western world, perhaps, and also Russian Chinese here, undermine the feeling of pride. And that we, and I've been part of this Western world, that we underestimate the, the need for for self-respect and for respect in the world. Iran is an old country with an old culture, and it cannot be told simply that Iran must behave itself, an expression that has been used. That's not the kind of language that one should use if one wants to have an agreement with Iran. Now, in Alma-Ata, uh, well, there were meetings in Istanbul, there was a meeting in Baghdad, there was a meeting in Moscow, and this was the time when they were really hitting the wall. They weren't getting anywhere. And they were, for instance, offering Iran that they should be given spare parts of airplanes if they were to agree to stop to suspend enrichment. And I think that sounded almost like a joke. It was so almost an insult, <laughs> not commensurate with what we were asking. But now in Almaty, it seems to me that there are some new signals. It see, um, they, what, what they said, according to what we have read in the newspapers that have been offered to the Iranians, they, there is a serious wish to get to perhaps an interim agreement, a partial uh, agreement, uh, a, a modus vivendi, and that they are not talking about the long-term uh, suspension of enrichment. Uh, it's clear that they want long-term total doing away with all enrichment, but that's not what they tackle now. They tackle the question of enrichment to 20%, which is needed for the fuel, the Triga reactor, and the Iranians have certainly enriched sufficient in quantities to to fill their needs for the new fuel there, and they have more than that. Now, earlier, the P5 plus 1 demanded, so I understood it, that Iran should surrender what they have, and then the other states would supply them from the outside. Now, that sounds like a very roundabout situation. Maybe there was some theology in it that they thereby would avoid recognizing that Iran had produced <laughs> uranium that they had produced themselves. But this time, it seems to me that they are conceding that yes, they can use the 20% in rich uranium that they need for the Triga reactor, and the rest perhaps will be sent, sent abroad. Now that's a, con a concession. Secondly, they or sign at any rate. Then they also say that you must not produce more 20% in rich uranium, which is understandable because if it's e much easier to, to enrich from 20 to 90% than it is from zero to to 20%. So the nervousness will be much greater if they were to exceed 20% or if they were to produce more than 20%. And the Iranians understand that. They actually have also taken a little step in a conciliatory direction by converting some of the 20% in rich uranium they have to fuel, fuel plates for the trigger reactor, and which thereby makes it much more difficult to go back to a, a form in which they could wait. So that's also a little sign which, which is quite significant from that side and perhaps side and shows that they too would have liked to have an agreement. Then you also had, had it uh, 
said that they should, the West, uh, the P5 plus one is demanding that Iran should close the Fordow plant, which is shielded and which cannot be destroyed from the air, apparently. It may have to be sabotaged, but not to, through the air. And uh, I think there's a bit nervousness that they would throw out the inspectors and that they would enrich to a higher level at the Fordow plant than they, than they do now. That is possible. At the same time, if you translate it into plain language, I think it sounds a bit odd. It means, in effect, that we, we tolerate that you can enrich at Natanz, which we can bomb, but for a plant, we cannot bomb, so you must stop it there. <laughs> it's, I think it has, has if I, enlighten me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the, you know, it, then there's another thing written in newspapers that Iran will be allowed to buy gold and, and other precious metals in the international market. And why this is so has not been explained to me. I thought first that it was a question of that they cannot get dollars or euros for their oil, but they will be allowed to sell oil and get gold. But that is de denied. They say that no, there is no, will be no change at all in the boycotting of Iraqi oil and gas. So it's a little mysterious to me. To me. Now, uh, this seems to me that they are they are seeking a sort of modus vivendi. The Iranians have not replied. There will be the technical meeting in Istanbul, and then there will be another meeting in Almaty. And I think both sides probably would like to have it, but they you know, they, 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 they modus vivendi. But you know, they have to be very careful not to hurt the pride here, because that will spoil it all, in my view. I certainly hope that this will work out, but it's clear that Israel will not be satisfied, nor will the P5 plus 1 be satisfied that enrichment process goes on, that uh, they have suspend, not suspended all of that. Because as long as there is enrichment, there's a possibility of throwing out inspectors, there's a possibility of going up to <coughs> higher levels, and the, bomb, the risk of a bomb will be there again. Now, could Israel do something then? Well, here I'm thinking outside the box and in, in lines that you may laugh at and some other people are laughing at. They are the, court, the ones that are most worried about Iran getting closer to the option. Uh, whether by building research reactors or enrichment or other ways, and they, they, uh, the, the record of from Mossirak and onward is clear. Now, what could Israel do? Well, here I come into the question of a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. The MPT review conference 2010 decided by a resolution that there should be a meeting on a zone free of weapons of mass destruction, not simply nuclear, but weapons of mass destruction before the end of 2012. Well, in the uh, the, the Finns offered themselves to be the host of the conference, and they appointed a, a facilitator for the conference who traveled around the region and inquired whether people were the people of the region, countries of the region, were willing to participate in the conference. And Israel didn't answer; they still have not answered. Iran answered in, I think, in November, said that yes, we are willing to participate. And somebody said that, well, that's because they know that the conference wouldn't take place or that the Israelis would be against it. I'm not so sure about that. I think that Iran might, uh, might be wanting the conference, and we have heard, I think, Khomeini saying, Khomeini saying later on that they wanted to, to have it. Now, the zone free of nuclear weapons, now the weapons of mass destruction, the others are not unimportant, the chemical and biological, they're not, un not unimportant at all, but I will focus on, on the nuclear one. The conference was put off, and many Arab states were very excited, angry about putting off the conference. The U.S. said no in language that almost sounded like sort of Tel Aviv. They said that before you have a peace in the region, etc., you cannot, this is unrealistic. Well, why did they go along with the resolution in 2010 then? So it, it must have been, the Israelis at the time, and I understand them, they said the problem in the world today is not the Israeli weapons. A conference dealing with taking out nuclear weapons from here, that will have its spotlight on Israel. The spotlight should be on Iran. Iran is the danger. We should not have the spotlight they wish to have. And therefore, I think they opposed it, I understandably, tactically, but, and the conference was off. But to a great deal of dismay, there were Arab states who were saying that, look, we think that MPT doesn't help us any longer. And they say that we might not participate in the next preparatory committee, commission, which will be in the spring. Some, not for, at the government level, but other levels said that we might withdraw from the MPT. We may not plan to go for weapons, but we might withdraw from the MPT. So there was a, a severe anger that the conference that planned for two days would make would not take place, and understandably, and understandably so. Now, what would could they agree to at a, such a conference? Certainly, it would be a, a, a project like Acres in, 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 in Spain that would take years to go there. Yes. However, the 
as I said, in the entity, nuclear weapon is not defined. It simply says that you shall not manufacture or otherwise acquire nuclear weapons. And in a zone, in a number of countries in a region, they are free to define nuclear weapons as they like. Is it only the hardware, the shell and the bomb, or is it also those that sit on the shelves? Is it also the fissile material that is ready to be put into it? Is it also perhaps the machines by which you enrich uranium or reprocess fuel to make the plutonium? If you define it broadly like that, you will have a zone that is not only doing away and, and prohibiting the possession of the ready shells, but also of enrichment and, and, and reprocessing at any rate, and perhaps some other sensitive procedures. Now, if there were an agreement on that in the long run, it would mean that Israel would have to do away with its nuclear weapons and its capability to produce them, and Iran would have to do away with its enrichment and its reprocessing plant. They don't have reprocessing yet, but they might get. And other countries in the region would have to commit themselves not to acquire this capability. Well, the answer will be, say, quite a comment will be immediately that, look, they might need this for their nuclear power in the future. I'm not suggesting you should make an agreement necessarily forever. It could be one for 25 years. If there are many nuclear power plants in the region by that time, maybe the parties will want to change it. Meanwhile, there will have to be an assurance of supply from the outside to supply the region. All those who have nuclear power, they don't, there will not be all that many in, in, the long run, in, the, in the short run to supply them with the uranium that, that they need. Now, Israel would gain then a commitment and an assurance that no one in the region will go for this. And I think possibly it's the mystique of the use of nuclear weapons that will hold them even back. I saw an opinion poll that indicated that 60% of those polled were ready to go ahead with uh, supported with a, a nuclear weapon being so 40% were against. The military or the government may have a different view. <coughs> That's possible. But we all know that Israel is not exactly militarily naked, even without nuclear weapons. And there would have to be security assurances as, as well in the region. So it's not totally implausible, although I think today they will probably laugh at me in, in Tel Aviv. And for others in the region, I think there would also be the relief that Israel no longer mm -hmm. has nuclear weapons. It has been felt like an insult from the others. They have joined the entity. Israel has not. They didn't, didn't adhere. And, and and there is this inequality that I think remains pain, painful. Maybe they could even, in the very long run, you could even have a Euratom in the Middle East, where a cooperation between countries on the, on the nuclear sector. But that's much further away. I think for the, the I end, I'm ending on this point, that for the time being, I think it is a modus vivendi that we will long for an interim agreement that will lower the tension, because the idea of a war right now is horrible. And for the longer run, I think we need a bit more of thinking outside the box. And if I throw out one more idea outside the box, <coughs> it would be that the Iranians might take the idea of uh, ratifying the comprehensive test ban agreement. They are not planning to test nuclear weapons. They don't want to have nuclear weapons. So what it could cost them anything, but it would be a nice gesture in a, in a conciliatory direction. And perhaps a little, it would also be a little sign that Israel and the United States could, could ratify the NPT, that they could take a step. So I think we need a bit of imaginative thinking. Uh, diplomacy is not over uh, yet. The uh, diplomats who are here and others, they can rack their brains and they come up with other, perhaps better ideas than those I've offered to you. Thank you, Hans. <laughs> I'd like to open the floor for questions, um, and I would ask the following, that you identify yourself and your affiliation, and probably more importantly, you wait for a microphone to, to come to you. Um, and I, I see two people already, uh, but I'm going to preempt you by asking the first question. <laughs> um, I, I don't like the, the word preemption, but I'm gonna use the, the act, take the action. Um, I, my question to you, uh, Hans, is under the NPT, uh, Iran is allowed to enrich uranium. And, and the real issue has, as I understand it, has been that people are worried uh, to 20% enrichment. Yet the United States, as a policy, has is essentially said, we want no enrichment. And I think the EU three have said something similar. Um, they are backing off that a little bit. But what risks do you think there are by allowing Iran to operate to, say, four, four and a half percent uh, enrichment 
with the proper protocols and then safeguards in place as opposed to the 20%. Do you think that's a, a, a relatively acceptable risk for the West or is it something that, uh, that other member states of the, of the United Nations are not going to, to tolerate and most specifically Israel? No, Israel will not like it, uh, but it is in its solution that has been proposed from many uh, from outside the government. Pickering and others have talked about, okay, up to 5% and with a very strong IEA in inspection. And clearly, the IEA would see uh, if there were any violation of that in the plants that are declared. Now, there could be a suspicion that there were more plants which have not been declared, that they're hidden, they were man managed to hide the folder plants for some time, but not for forever. So I think it is, it is better than, than nothing. Uh, but it's also clear that one day they could throw out the inspectors, and uh, if something happened, they throw out the inspectors, they said that we now well, might even leave the NPT. But it would be a very big signal to the world that there's a changed situation, and it would allow the world to, to take action. The bigger danger could perhaps be that they did something, did something secretly. That exists uh, in any situation up there. I mean, the inspectors, and I've dealt a lot with inspection, they can never <coughs> be a, a hunt. There's always this, a, a re little residue risk in a big country. In the case of Iraq, of course, we could never say that there was not this, not some small thing somewhere. It could be, but we were convinced at that time there was no infrastructure, significant infrastructure left in the country, no big items. And the Iran, uh, the Iran, they also have an opposition. They, they, it's not like North Korea, which is hermetically closed, and where they could build an enrichment plant without any no knowing it until they invited Mr. Hecker to, <laughs> to see it in Yongbyon. But Iran is more open country, and you have people who can also uh, be whistle, <coughs> blowing the whistle. So, no, it's conceivable that could could get there. But uh, for the to today. The P5 plus one have not dropped the, the idea, the aim of also doing away with all enrichment. And, and as I said, I don't think that it is economical. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> uh, we'll start right here and please wait for the microphone and then next here. My name is Yusuf Masha, uh, a businessman and a member of the WISS. My question goes to the Fully beginning. Uh, why? Why do we need to have restrictions on countries to have nuclear weapons? Uh, why not every country to have nuclear weapons? Mm. If there are countries who owns it, why not the others? Mm. We have a very good experience for years between India and Pakistan, and there is no strong conflict in the world as much as that conflict. And both countries are nuclear power countries. But there were no risk to these, mm. uh, uh, to this situation as much as we have risk in a countries that they don't even yet have it. And they are maybe they will have it. Mm. My question really is, why? Why do we have to control it? Mm -hmm. If other countries has it, why not the other countries should not have it? Mm. Well, sir, uh, the, um, the Chinese government under Mao Zedong had a similar view at one time. <laughs> but they have changed their view over time. And it, it is true that India and Pakistan have succeeded. They have the sort of mutually assured destruction. Uh, but it is not free of risk. Uh, the, some people believe or try to hold that the peace that we have had after the Second World War uh, between Russia and the United States was due to the fact that they could destroy each other mutually. Uh, I don't think so. I'm not convinced by that. And we, we have a number of cases <coughs> which show that they were pretty close to getting into a confrontation. Perry was the Minister, Secretary of Defense for a while, had reported on it. The best known case was during the Cuban crisis when there was a Russian submarine outside Cuba, and uh, they were attacked, and they had instructions would allow them to, to release a nuclear weapon. And they had a discussion on the submarine, eventually concluded that they wouldn't use that option. So they came very close to it. 
So it's a very risky thing to have. I think also the Indian and Pakistanis, even though they have succeeded to keep away from it, is, is uh, they are nervous about it. And the idea of having a whole world full of countries with more nuclear triggers and more fingers on the nuclear triggers, it becomes very, un very uncomfortable. So, but, but I agree with you that there is an inequality. The NPT is an unequal treaty in accepting or tolerating five countries to have nuclear weapons and the others are committed not to have it. But I think the answer to that is nuclear disarmament of those who have it, rather than bringing equality by the others getting it. I would just add to that that uh, it might be worthwhile to read some of the writings of Professor Scott Sagan from Stanford University, who has detailed some of the accidents that occurred during the Cuban Missile Crisis that could have led to war. Um, and it's a fascinating read. And, uh, I can point you to those articles, but it's, it's quite frightening how close we really did come, uh, and in some cases by pure miscalculation and accident. Yes? Thank you for an uh, informative uh, talk. My name is Dr. Mansour Larayev. I'm the chairman of Gulf Council for Foreign Relations. Uh, I just have the following say, scenario. Say tomorrow Iran becomes a nuclear state. U.S. can live with it. Israel cannot. In your view, what is the implication of such a scenario? Well, uh, as we all agreed, uh, we would like to get through negotiations a situation where they will not acquire nuclear weapons. So you're asking a hypothetical question which many ask themselves uh, rightly. I think Iran would know that using or even threatening it with a new nuclear weapon might bring disaster to, them, to themselves. The chances that they would make use of it, I think, are, are really in minimal. They know that there would be a response that would be terrible. So I, if I, you press me and say, uh, are you accepting a nuclear weapon in Iran? I say, no, I think there are, there are ways of solving it. I have pointed to some diplomatic means that could lead in that, that direction. But even if they were to have it, <coughs> I don't think that is a casus belli. They would have to withdraw from the NPT. Now, if they withdraw from the NPT, the United States withdrew from the ABM Treaty. North Korea withdrew from the NPT. <coughs> then it would not be illegal for them to have it even. Is it free for other countries then to attack them and smash them? that they have not expressed any intention to make use of it. They have said, we want it because you are threatening us. You have a US aircraft carriers uh, in, in the Gulf with the Fifth Fleet stationed here. Uh, aren't we under a greater threat than anybody else is from us? So I would not draw the conclusion that there is a right of attack of attacking them, even if they were to have a nuclear weapon. But I think that it can, it ought to be possible to avoid getting it, and my, although I admit, I don't know whether there would be groups in Iran that would want to have it. It's possible, I cannot exclude that. My gut feeling, for what it is worth, is that they would like to be close to the option and not more than that. Dr. Glitz. Yeah, please, no, we were on the, the internet as well, sorry. The, Achilles, the um, right to enrich has been described as the Achilles heel of the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty. Can you comment on options as to removing the right to enrich from the NPT itself and moving to a global nuclear uh, bank? I think it's excluded that you would have an amendment to the NPT that would prohibit enrichment or reprocessing. The non-nuclear weapon states, I think, say rightly, uh, as a group, that look, we are the ones who are undertaken, under, <coughs> undertaking limitations on it. And here, and you are the ones who have not done disarmament. Here you come to us and say that we, the lambs, must pull out further teeth while you are keeping your teeth all together. So I think they would not, on block, they would say no to that. Uh, secondly, there are states like Brazil, Argentina and others who have enrichment, Japan, say, no, we would not go along with that. 
we have in Richmond and we need it eco economically. So that in my view, there is no chance that the MPT, you can have a revision to get this through. But regionally, and that's what I'm talking about in the nuclear weapon free zone, regionally it can be done if the countries find it to their advantage. And I remind you that in the case of Korea, in the Korean non denuclearization agreement that is has been void and dead by now, <laughs> but it was concluded at the beginning of the 90s. They agreed that neither North Korea nor South Korea would have enrichment or repossessing. And that was for a purpose. That was to give them assurances that neither side would go in that direction. Well, it was violated and the agreement is not. But it shows that in a regional context, it may be to the advantage of the countries in question. Brazil may not perhaps applaud a, a treaty on a nuclear weapon, a, a zone free of enrichment and reprocessing in the Middle East, but they would not object. They said, this is your business. And it should not be imposed from the outside. No, I don't think so. I think the idea should come from the inside that we have the use of we, You should not tell us what to do, but we should find out what is our, in our interest. And, and I, I simply put the, table, the idea on the table and see whether anyone will pick it up somewhere. Well, you mentioned, uh, Hans, that the, you know, the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, which, was, which is aimed to do almost exactly what you're, you're suggesting, um, and that it's run into roadblocks, uh, namely by Pakistan. Um, what do you think would be required uh, for Pakistan to accept the FMTC? Do you see anything that the world community could do to encourage or uh, impel the uh, Pakistan to accept it, and if that were to occur, do you see other hurdles um, besides the U.S. Congress? Well, I'm afraid I don't quite understand the uh, stiff Pakistani objections to it, because as things are, uh, without any ban or control of further enrichment and reprocessing in Pakistan and India, there must be a risk. Uh, Pakistanis must see a risk that India continues to enrich more uranium. That is not prevented by the agreement with the United States or the safeguards agreement with, the, with India. And so the Pakistanis may also increase their supply and probably do increase their numbers of nuclear weapons and material. And you may have a race between the two. Will not, that not perhaps also influence China one day? If they see that India is increasing, in, China is one of the countries that have really been restrained. They don't have more than a couple of hundred nuclear weapons when the others have gone much, much further. But if they see that India is piling <coughs> on top, will that restraint remain in China or not? So I see with great worry about a situation in which you will <coughs> not having a fissile material cut off in the region. I think the Pakistanis are objecting to the in perhaps stocking of fissile material would not be con included in this. And that has been an objection of, of Arab states too, that if you have the fissile material cut off, you must also include the stocks of of material. That may be a reason <coughs> behind Pakistan. But I think it's very worrisome, and, uh, and uh, I wish that we could persuade them to go on to this, because that's a, an agreement which, uh, which could help in other parts of the world, too. Uh, the, if the fissile material cutoff is like closing the tap. I mean, we have the bombs, oh yes, and we have the material, but this would close the tap of making more material for more weapons would be a modest beginning. I, I would note that it's, it's interesting, and, and Senator Nunn always points this out, that uh, a lot of the uranium that was used for Russian nuclear weapons has actually been reprocessed for fuel uh, elements in nuclear reactors. And I think 10 oh, yeah. to 20% of all electricity generated in the United States is from former um, Russian and American bombs. Yeah, we are talking about megatons going into megawatts. Yeah. <laughs> Ambassador Smirnov. I'm close, therefore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your um, very interesting presentation. I think uh, it is a lucky chance to have here a person who accompanied our professional career all our life, from the students from college <laughs> till, up, <laughs> till today. Um, the questions and answers here are more or less practical, pragmatic even I say, but I want to ask you one existential or existentialistic question. Could, uh, you know, Russians have their own reservations about anti-missile 
defense systems which are closely connected with nuclear proliferation, nuclear weapon. But don't you think that the nuclear weapon as it is, chemical weapon, biological, are very, are becoming more and more outdated? And could we expect in the near future, or could we see in our uh, age, that we shall receive such a system of counterbalancing this nuclear weapon can, that can make this nuclear or weapons of mass destruction ineffective. Well, that there will be no need to develop, no sense to develop nuclear weapon. We will, shall be protected in any form. I don't know which form. That uh, anti-missile defense systems are only, only the first steps on this uh, uh, R&D programs. At, at the same time, could it happen that at some day we shall get, due to very quick uh, mm, researchers and uh, modernization, we shall get such uh, possibilities to press other, others in the world arena that, again, nuclear weapon will be a childish game? Well, Reagan's idea behind the what was called the Star Wars, was that they would build an anti-missile missile defense uh, that it would not be useful to have nuclear weapons any longer. But I think the reality and the objections to that has been that there are so many, well, first of all, you need to construct something there by shooting with one bullet here, another bullet will hit it, which may be a bit of an engineering problem, and you know more about it <laughs> most than most people do. But the other is that you can also have so many decoys that uh, going up in the air, and to shoot them down, all of them, you don't, if you have a nuclear weapon in one or in two of them, well, that may, may hit. So when the Europeans are, are and you, with the US and NATO, are building up an anti-missile anti -missile defense in Romania, wherever it is now, then it seems to me that it would not really protect against a nuclear weapon. It might protect against some missiles, but if among these missiles there were one or two nuclear weapons, it really won't protect them. And frankly, I'm a bit amazed at this debate. Uh, I'm no longer a government civil servant, so I can say what, what I like. I don't know anyone in Europe who really feels that we need a missile defense against Iran. Um, I hear that people in Brussels, NATO, and other places, they want to but I don't, I don't see quite what we, we don't feel a threat that Iran would launch a rocket on Europe. That's totally theoretical. And yet, and I think the, the, the cost of it being that the Russians perhaps unrightly are, are worried about and said that in the, in the future, you know, they may develop this and may be a threat to, to us. Yeah, may they, maybe they are wrong in that. But I, but I think that if the cost of building them up is that the Russians will believe this and that will stop disarmament between Europe and the United States and on the one hand and Russia on the other, I think it's a very high cost to, to pay. And yet, this is beyond the, the heads of people. This is a, a debate that is carried out behind the strategists. Well, they play with the bean counting all the time and we ordinary citizens are, are not really much engaged in it any longer. But I, my, one further point to your question, and that is that we are talking about nuclear weapons. I think we should also broaden the horizon. We know that the real weapons of mass destruction today are not nuclear weapons, but they are small caliber weapons. They are the ones that kill in large numbers. <coughs> and we have had now in New York a de 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 conference about a treaty to ban and control the sale of, of these, these weapons, non-automatic non weapons. Mm -hmm. and that ran into difficulty in the American, and they stopped for a while during the American election campaign, understandably, because it would have been a sensitive issue, I think, for, for Obama. Now it may, may start again. It was a very modest measure, but it, it tried to outlaw and stop illegal sale of fine caliber weapons. And there's a lot of, of that going on as well. So <coughs> that's one, that's the other end, nuclear weapons here and the fine caliber weapons there. But in between, you know, the world is spending 1,000, I said 1,800 billion dollars a year on military expenses. And we are not able to scrape together 100 million dollars a year to a fund that will help the developing countries to meet the, the global warming and change the energy system. I mean, that, that's preposterous. I'm more scared of the global warming than I'm scared about the nuclear weapons, frankly. 
yeah, nuclear weapons is in the hands of a handful of a dozen states, and I if they are not mad in their behavior, I think it can be managed. But the global warming is a matter of we all using electricity, all using cars, and it's very difficult to stop, and I think we need to focus on that, not for our own, for our generation, but for our grandchildren. It's very obvious that you're not a member of the Republican Party in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> um, I know Mark Allworthy has a question. We are drawing to the uh, conclusion of today's tonight's session, but um, if anyone else has a question, please raise your hand or wherever, hold your peace. We have, okay, one back there that, that's hiding. Okay, so Mark, and then we'll go there, and we'll do those consecutively, allow Dr. Blix, oh, and a third one. Okay, so we'll do those three questions consecutively and then allow uh, Dr. Blix to address them. Mark? <clears throat> Thank you again for coming, Dr. Blix. It's a pleasure to have you here. And it's a wonderful address, I thought. Um, I have maybe an unfair question. Um, who do you feel now is in the driving seat uh, behind the negotiations? Do you feel that the Iranians uh, must sense, as you've pointed out, and as Mike and others in the informed community realize, that a military strike isn't necessarily in the best interests of the international community. Do you feel that the, this gives the Iranians more leverage in these negotiations, or do you feel still that the threat of a military strike is, is sufficient to give the, uh, the Americans, Israelis, and others uh, more potential? Well, I think Kofi Annan said somewhere that uh, building up and diplomacy may need to be backed up by a threat of force. And it is true, I don't think that Iraq would have allowed our, us in as inspectors in 2002 if it had not been for the American buildup. So I admit that there are situations when this may be so. But there are also situations, I think, in which threats or implicit threats may undermine diplomacy. If you go to the negotiation table and we said we want you to, to agree to this, and at the same time you hold the pistol, well that's not a negotiation, that is asking the other fellow to kneel. And if you have a, a proud party on the other side, they don't. And a fear I have is that the West is boxing itself into a, a corner. Uh, we have heard for a long time Obama and others saying that all the options are on the table. Well, that's a euphemism for saying that we don't exclude military means. Uh, but now we have also heard them, them say more than that, that the window of diplomacy does not stay open forever. There is an end to it. And that worries me war. Uh, how, how long is the, win the window open? I don't know. Uh, but if they say we will not tolerate that there will be an Iranian weapon. Well, in one way, it may say to the Iranians that let us stop shortly before this so that they cannot say we are making a weapon. And that's the intention behind it. But where do they draw the line? In the US, you, you hear Senator Lindsey Graham say that's a question we cannot tolerate Ira Iranian capacity. Well, where does the capacity begin? I mean, he may be more eager go to go to war. So the, fine, the calibrating, the calibrating of this is, is, a, is a very, very da dangerous issue. Uh, if, if you do it wrongly, then you may have backed yourself into a war. If you don't, if you stay away from the war, then you may look as a paper tiger. That's the, that's the risk of that side. And therefore, going into high pitch is a very risky business. I remember a story, say, about, about diplomacy. You are some diplomacy, I can say, that diplomats are people who think twice before saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's very wise. <laughs> it's far better than saying something and then think twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I wish they would calibrate this business. <laughs> we have a question back there, and then right after that, we'll go here. So if you could allow both of them to ask the question, Hans. Thank you, Dr. Hans Blitz, for your wonderful speech. Um, I come from, I'm a pupil from St. Christopher School, Bahrain. Um, my question is that um, you just mentioned how Pakistan and India are um, mm -hmm. developing into a nuclear state. Um, if there is, is there any chance for them, uh, India and Pakistan, to come close to a nuclear war? And if this scenario comes true, um, what are the risks of it? How would it affect the whole world? How would it uh, how it would affect each of the country, and 
what would be your solutions to this issue? I mean, uh, uh, apart from disarmament, what would you <coughs> recommend to solve this issue if this comes through? I think that the India and Pakistan have managed to control the nuclear to a large extent. They have discussions about it and they're indicating the locations where they have capacity and so forth. So they've handled it prudently so far. That doesn't mean that it's not a risk if the nationalist passions are let loose or if the control of the forces are not there, you could have things happening. I mean, at the root of it, I, I think the important part is the Kashmirs, the political conflict over Kashmir. And I meet many people from the subcontinent who think that that, that is you politically. You can see the solution, but as in the case of the Middle East, you don't see how to get there. The solution is there how, or not. I, I doubt that a war, even a nuclear war between the two, would inflame and, and create a, a global conflagration. I think it would stay local. I do not, do not see, I mean, if would China intervene to rescue Pakistan and if they were really pressed? I, I doubt that it would, be, would spread, but it's been enough of a catastrophe <laughs> if it happened in the subcontinent with the huge masses of people who are there. For the time being, I, it seems to me that it's handled prudent, but that we would like to see more courage in the approach to the Kashmir issue, because that is, is the major issue at, at the root. And I think we have one last question in the back. Good evening, Dr. Hans. I'm Jennifer Niana, business journalist with the Gulf Business and Analysis magazine. Um, with more states acquiring access to nuclear technology, there's a very real possibility of a leak. And we've seen that with um, the Pakistani scientists who helped North Korea not so long ago. So how worried are nuclear experts such as yourself about the possibility of a leak? And what, what are inter international bodies such as the IAEA doing to contain transfer of technology into the world? Thank you. Well, the technology for the weapons <coughs> is in, in large part different from the technology that you need for the nuclear power. But of course, the basic nuclear science is, is the same. Uh, and you need enrichment for the uh, light water reactors that we are using. As I described, there is a strong effort in what's called nuclear security in making sure that you have research reactors that operate on low, low enriched uranium rather than high enriched uranium. Uh, and we had a fair amount of traffic in nuclear material after the breakup of the Soviet Union, and there were lots of shams, actually that came about. They were selling red mercury, subject that sub substance that didn't exist and so forth. But still, there's a lot of nuclear material around, uh, used in medicine and other places, and the risk of so-called dirty bombs are there. They gather some material that is radioactive, and they could explode it in a public place somewhere. Uh, no, it will not have any, it will not be a, a disaster of <coughs> destroying a city, but it will contaminate an area, and it will certainly spread a lot of terror if it were to happen. So that's bad enough. And therefore, I think it's very good that we get a system under which all countries feel responsible to keep order and keep track of their nuclear material. And that is one purpose behind the Resolution 1540 of the Security Council, under which states must have registers of all the material and keep track of it. But, you know, the, the world is big, and keeping track of it is, is not going to be perfect everywhere. Administrations are not perfect everywhere in the world. So some risk for for, for uh, dirty weapons, yes, I think there will be real, that, that will continue to exist. As to the question from, if I understood you rightly, asking about the, the le possible leakage from the nuclear power into nuclear weapons, well, that was the purpose of the safeguards, that the IA would be there with the safeguards inspectors to uh, check and to verify that there is only a, a peaceful use being made of it. And Again, the, there is not a zero risk on this. Uh, countries can hide things and do it secretly. It is harder in a democracy, harder in an open country than in a very close country. But a total zero risk, uh, I don't think there is. But we, when peop some people say that you know the nuclear power is bad because the countries will go from nuclear power to nuclear weapons, well, I remind you that most, in most cases, countries have gone from nuclear weapons to nuclear power. 
China had nuclear weapons before it had nuclear power. Israel has only nuclear weapons so far. So that's not, not really correct. You can have nuclear power without nuclear weapons, and you can have nuclear weapons without nuclear power. And a great many countries have nuclear power without nuclear weapons, as my own country does, Abu Dhabi does, and many others do. So I'm not, although the risk again are not, not zero, I think that's a risk that we can take. We must, in, in the field of energy, there is nothing without some risk. Uh, and, and from my IAEA period, I, I remember that the greatest accidents in terms of lives lost in the field of energy were from hydropower. We were a bit surprised. But when big dams burst, you have enormous quantities of waters that go downtown and destroy villages and so forth. It doesn't, it's not lasting. Nuclear will leave stains that may be radioactive for a long time. But even in Chernobyl, I've been Chernobyl fa fairly often because I'm a chairman of the, of the group of states that are putting a new sh shell on, on the destroyed reactor. Even there, people are now moving back into the 30 kilometer zone. Uh, so it doesn't last uh, forever. But totally without risk, it is not. To me, <coughs> and people say that we are worried about the nuclear waste, I'm saying that I'm much more worried about the waste of fossil fuel that we're producing so diligently in this country <laughs> <laughs> because it goes out in the atmosphere. It's part of the normal operation that this waste goes up there with the carbon dioxide and all. In nuclear, it could happen in the context of an accident, and that's bad, but we, one, should not, one should also see the merits of it. Without risk, no, it doesn't exist, but, but the, if some risk we must take and, and minimize them. But I want to say one last word on this. <coughs> I would be about the United Nations. I touched on it in the beginning and said that the UN, t there's no way in which you can wage an attack on Iran without violating the UN Charter. And some people will take issue with me on that matter. But I, I do think that all countries, and in particular the smaller countries in the world, have a very strong interest in building up and strengthening the United Nations. I also see that after the second after the Second World War, we have not had any big wars. The number of wars in the world, you may not feel it in the neighborhood of Syria and this region, the number of wars, the armed countries have gone down. And also the number of people killed have gone down. And we have come to a situation where we think it's practically incon inconceivable that you could have another war between the great powers in the world. So we may be moving into an era when we certainly will have regional conflicts, we'll certainly have some civil wars going on, but going in, into a direction when there is less war. We don't have a world government. We will not be there for a long time. We will not have majority voting in the General Assembly. But we are surely very slowly moving in the direction of more international governance. In the beginning of the 19th century, there were very few intergovernmental organizations at all. The World Postal Union, Telegraphic Union, and a few others. And now you have an enormous number of them. Some jealousy as to what is given to the, this, uh, this competence that is given to. In the same way as the republics of the US don't want to give anything to the central government there. The people in, in the countries around the world, they don't like to give any competence to the international organization. But that's where we are going, and that's where we have, have to go in order to manage the, the globalization that, that we are in. So a deliberate build-up of the UN and the international governance system is absolutely indispensable. With the bureaucracies they have, with the weaknesses they have, yes. But we, we need to, to go that, that way. Well, Dr. Blitz, thank you very much. I, I always leave a, a discussion uh, with you greatly enriched and far smarter than when I started, but I also realize just how much more I have to learn. But I, I do thank you and I'd like everyone else to, to thank Dr. Blitz for a wonderful <laughs> hour.